Father, again, we're delighted to be here, excited about your word. Thank you, Lord, for the amazing discoveries that we can make in your word. We pray that you'd bless our time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, the genetics of the mark of the beast, how Satan plans to cause mankind to take his DNA. Now, just a little bit of review. We've got to go back to Genesis 3.15. This is where this whole saga begins. Because in Genesis 3.15, God says to Satan, I will cause enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And really the bottom line is that there's this enmity. It's an antithetical or opposite, converse or contradictory. And if her seed equals the Christ, and that is almost universally accepted that her seed is the Christ, then your seed, speaking to Satan, must be referring to the antithesis, that is, the Antichrist. So we have to then look at the genetics of that because there was the genetics of the incarnation. And I talk about this at length in my book, Corrupting the Image, also in the DVD, The Genetics of the Incarnation. But understanding what is seed, what is, when the Bible talks about seed, what is it talking about? It's not just talking about so something you put in the ground, but think about that. What is that little watermelon seed that you plant? Or whatever seed that you have, what is that? We, we can feel it, there's a, there's a husk, and inside there's a kernel. But inside of all that, inside the chromosomes and the genes, there's DNA, there's a double helix, there are nucleic acids, but still, what is all that? All of that stuff is the hardware, it's the software that we're really getting at. The software, just like on that CD-ROM that you might put in your computer, it's a piece of plastic. You don't care about the plastic, you care about the information that is on that CD-ROM. So DNA is the source code of humanity, it's the essence of the seed that scripture so often talks about. The term seed is in modern terms called a gamete, which in the male is the sperm and in the female is the ovum. Thus when Mary conceived, it meant that her ovum provided 23 chromosomes, and hence the Holy Spirit provided the other 23 chromosomes. And at the beginning when Adam and Eve sinned, you see the master programmer had endowed them with perfect code and only at their fall did their code become corrupted. So the, the chemical code built on the A, G, T, and C nucleic acids became corrupted as a result of the shuffling of the order of those bits or a loss of one or more bits. And Adam, as the father of the race, had a perfect, and a direct creation of God, had a perfect code. There was no loss of data or corruption of the data in any way. Think of it like when you, you have a picture, you put that picture in a photocopier, and then you take a photocopy of that, a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy, until eventually you've lost so much information you can't tell what the original image was. That is essentially what has happened in the human race. When God created Adam and Eve, their code was perfect. Their DNA was perfect, and when the death entered in, there was a loss of information. That death, uh, it became corrupted, and then we've had, we're all copies of copies of copies. So if you've ever wondered if your kids are kind of mutant, they really are. But the bad news is so are you. We're all mutants because we are all in a process of decomposition and, and corruption of our data. And what I... Really, the, the aha moment for me of putting all this information together was when I read Dr. Werner Gitt's book, In the Beginning Was Information. And he talks about how information is a non-material or a mental entity. He says that information is a fundamental entity and there is therefore not a, it's not a proper of, property of matter. He formulates several theorems in order to describe the information. In theorem one, he states, the fundamental quantity information is a non-material mental entity. It is not a property of matter so that purely material processes are fundamentally precluded as sources of information. In theorem number three, he notes that it is information which comprises the non-material foundation for all technological systems and for all works of art. So again, thinking of that CD-ROM, the CD-ROM is the plastic, that's the hardware, but it's the information that you cannot see. 
Sure, we can describe it. If you could look really closely at that CD-ROM, you'd see that there's a, a bunch of bumps up and down. It's either on or off. But still, that isn't the information. It's the sum total that's encoded in there that the information you cannot touch. Even though we can store it on a physical medium, the information itself is immaterial. And that's when we talk about the seed. That's really what's at the heart of it. It's not just the hardware. It's the software that has great significance. And once you get that, you begin to realize that we are using this each and every day. When we send an email, right, we, we have the physical information that we type in with our fingers, for it, let's say, and then we send it over the internet. And we're going to discover that you can even send, you can send DNA over the internet as well. It's getting kind of crazy what we're able to do. But part two of this saga is the attempts to corrupt the image that Satan has been working on since the very beginning. We see in Genesis chapter 6, when humankind began to multiply in the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God, B'nai Elohim, saw that the daughters of humankind, Banot Adam, were beautiful. Now, the word also there is that they were good, so I think they were good for something. Thus they took wives for themselves, for many they chose. So the Lord said, My spirit will not remain in humankind indefinitely, for they are mortal. They will remain for 120 more years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also after this when the sons of God were having sexual relations with the daughters of humankind who gave birth to their children. Now there were conceivably over 10 to 17 billion people on planet earth at that time. And we have to understand that it was not simply the wickedness of mankind that was obviously a huge part of it, but it was the story of the Nephilim is why God destroyed planet Earth. And unfortunately, uh, in many churches and seminaries, they're leaving this story out. They're saying it's the sons of Seth instead of the fallen angels. And then it doesn't make any kind of sense whatsoever if we see that this is talking about the sons of Seth. So we have to understand that, that all the pre-New Testament Jewish texts and even the Christian texts understood the reference there in Genesis chapter 6 as a reference to fallen angels. They never thought it was talking about the sons of Seth uh, marrying the daughters of Cain. That was invented by Augustine, essentially. And uh, nobody thought that. So we see it in the Tales of the Patriarchs, also known as the Genesis Apocryphon, Philo, who was a contemporary of Jesus, the Aramaic Targumim of the Pentateuch, Josephus and others, they all unanimously said that it was fallen angels that came down and had relations with women that, that created this hybrid race. So when Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so the coming of the Son of Man would be, I suspect that the disciples were kind of floored. Really? You mean that's going to happen again? Uh-huh, that's what's coming again. So this was the consistent interpretation again and again and again. So the sons of God were fallen angels, the same that Jude and Peter spoke about that are kept in chains of darkness reserved in judgment. They came to the daughters of Adam and from their union were born the Nephilim, which consisted of human demonic genetic material. That's important to understand. Human demonic genetic material. And I understand that fallen angels and demons are one and the same. Uh, if you disagree, we can debate that afterward. But um, I don't see any scriptural reference to think otherwise. The Nephilim, or the fallen ones, were also known in Greek as the Gegenes, that is, the of the earth. They were, they were earth-born. And they were the famous men of the ancient world. The Gegenes in the Greek traditions were hybrid creatures, half human and half god, or that is, demonic. And all of the ancient Jewish traditions believed that the Nephilim were hybrids, half human and half demonic. We uh, talked about in the book, King Og of Bashan, he measured about 15 feet tall. He was a Nephilim. He weighed around 3,100 pounds. He needed at least 22,000 calories to keep his heart beating every day. Canaan was indeed a land that devoured its inhabitants. The inhabitants were the Nephilim, and hence the complete extermination of the seven nations was needed when the children of Israel came into the land. And the genetic mingling of demonic and human could not be tolerated just as it could not back in the days of Noah. You see, Satan heard that he would be crushed by the seed of the woman, so he, he tries to destroy all of humankind in the days of Noah. And then he overhears this conversation between God and Abraham. I'm going to bless you, Abraham, through your seed. 
all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. Messiah would come through uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and David. And this is why we see this increased hostility toward Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and it goes on even today. And that's why there was a huge push to try to destroy uh, the Jews and also to try, try to destroy Jesus when he came on planet Earth. Well, thankfully, Satan has failed in all of those attempts. But, and the, the, the underlying principle is that everything was to reproduce according to its kind, according to Genesis 1.24, and the demons clearly broke this commandment. So this is all the background that I cover in two other uh, studies. But this now brings us up to part three, the genetics of the mark of the beast. It's the final attempt to corrupt the image that God created in man. And if Satan, Satan believes if he can corrupt that, he will have a tie with God. Uh, also, he wants to destroy the Jewish people, and maybe he can have a tie with God. He, he's coming at this from a, a multifaceted approach. But the demonic deception, uh, well, there are many Bible scholars that see UFO activity as demonic. Walter Martin, for example, believed that demons have been masquerading as extraterrestrials. Dave Hunt said it this way, UFOs are clearly not physical and seem to be demonic manifestations from another dimension calculated to alter man's way of thinking. John Ankerberg and John Weldon state the fact that all UFO phenomena are consistent with the demonic theory indicate that this explanation is the best possible answer for the solution to the UFO mystery. And there's propaganda all over the place. Of course, we have the movie Prometheus, where aliens drop off their DNA on planet Earth. And then that, from that DNA, all life on planet Earth begins to evolve. That is a very, very prevalent theory. We also have, for example, the Nicolas Cage movie Knowing 2009, where it's the aliens that come and save the day. Planet Earth is going to be destroyed by a solar flare, but the aliens care enough to save humanity. They care enough to save the animals. And they take them two by two in these arcs and put them on different planets. So we learn that, that it's the aliens that are both our progenitors and also our saviors. Many references to God, to Jesus throughout the movie, but where are they in the end? They let the world be destroyed, but thankfully those aliens are coming to save the day. Even in this uh, ABC movie in 2006, Fallen, this young man Aaron discovers that he is the savior of the Nephilim. It's his job to get the Nephilim. That's the word they use in the, in the, in the story, to get the Nephilim back to heaven. What? The Nephilim are the bad guys, not the good guys. And yet, uh, this is his job. He's the chosen one. And it's his job to, to see that that happens. We also see the genetic alteration in the movies. And I have to admit, when I was a kid, I dreamed of being the Incredible Hulk. Don't make me mad. Because I'll get big, green, and ugly. You'll be sorry. Right? Eh, probably secretly every boy wants that, right? I'm going to turn into an Incredible Hulk if you don't... Yes, girls too. They wouldn't look so good as the Incredible Hulk, though. It'd be kind of weird. You know, so... But, you know, this is, this is what we have are the X-Men. Aren't they cool and sophisticated, huh? We all kind of dream about this. How awesome that would be if I could just be transformed. Or how about going from this, the 90-pound weakling, to becoming Captain America? And all I have to do is take some serum and I become this really buff dude. How cool would that be? I mean, I would almost sign up for that if that were possible. Or, of course, Spider-Man. But what they all have in connection is that there's some kind of a genetic transformation that is going on. So this is the propaganda that we're getting. And we're all kind of hungry for that because as we age, we see that our bodies begin to break down. They're not acting quite the way they ought to. Or even if we're in good shape, wouldn't it be fun to be that much better? Or we have this uh, music video from Katy Perry where she's singing about making love to an alien. Could you be the devil? Could you be an angel? You're not like the others, futuristic lover different DNA. You're from a whole other world, a different dimension. Infect me with your love, fill me with your poison, want to be a victim ready for abduction. Hundreds of millions of people have seen this video and it's straight from the pit of hell, but it's camouflaged in beautiful uh, imagery. It's this hideous kind of beauty. And at the end of the video, you see that she actually turns out to be a fawn. She's half deer and half human. 
And you see that because she, she drops her, her, her clothes and you can see her tail walking off into the sunset uh, while this, this alien becomes kind of a, a uh, technological wonder of sorts. And that is the message that is being pumped out all over the place, whether it's really in a great fashion in the movies like the X-Men or in this very strange, uh, perverted sexual thing in, in her video. Well, we also have uh, good testimony from reliable people. It's not just propaganda, but we have uh, people who are witnessing the return of the fallen angels. Here's Captain Edgar D. Mitchell. We all know that UFOs are real. All we need to ask is where do they come from? And then an ABC News poll conducted in 2000 discovered that nearly half of Americans and millions more globally believe that we're not alone. Four million Americans say that we have seen or know someone who has seen an unidentified flying object. A growing number believe they've actually met aliens. Ronald Reagan says, I looked out the window and saw this white light. It was zigzagging around. I went up to the pilot and said, have you ever seen something like that? He was shocked and said, nope. And I said to him, let's follow it. We followed it for several minutes. It was bright white light. We followed it to Bakersfield. This is here in California. And all of a sudden, to our utter amazement, it went straight up into the heavens. John F. Kennedy, the U.S. Air Force, assures me that UFOs pose no threat to national security. Or we have President Gerald Ford. I strongly recommend that there be a committee investigation of the UFO phenomenon. I think we owe it to the people to establish credibility regarding UFOs and to produce the greatest possible enlightenment on this subject. Jimmy Carter says, I do not laugh at people anymore when they say they've seen UFOs. I've seen one myself. And even Barry Goldwater, I certainly believe in aliens and space, and they are indeed visiting our planet. They may not look like us, but I have very strong feelings that they have advanced beyond our mental capabilities. We have General Douglas MacArthur. You now face a new world, a world of change. We speak in strange terms of harnessing the cosmic energy of ultimate conflict between the united human race and the sinister forces of some other planetary galaxy. The nations of the world will have to unite, for the next war will be an interplanetary war. The nations of the Earth must someday make a common front against attack by people from other planets. You see, they are ready. These are not some crackpots who are off smoking something strange. These are the world leaders, at least they were the world leaders, and we probably should have, you know, they do have credibility. Whether you believe them or not, they do have credibility, and this is what they see coming. Uh, Colonel L. Gordon Cooper, Mercury 7 astronaut, he said to the United Nations in 1978, I believe that these extraterrestrial vehicles and their crews are visiting this planet from other planets which obviously are a little more advanced than we are. And here's what really gets me. Maurice Chatelain, former chief of NASA communication system, says all, notice that all Apollo and Gemini flights were followed. All Apollo and Gemini flights were followed, both at a distance and sometimes also quite closely by space vehicles of extraterrestrial origin, flying saucers or UFOs, if you want to call them by that name. Every time it occurred, the astronauts informed Mission Control, who then ordered absolute silence. Absolute silence. So we hear it from the presidents, we hear it from the astronauts, we hear it from the chief of NASA communication systems, that yes, there is something out there. There are extraterrestrial vehicles. They're called UFOs because they don't know exactly what they are. And I believe that many of those are demonically inspired. It is possible that the government has cooked up some really cool craft that's very possible, but I think in many of the cases, we're actually talking about demonically enhanced or demonically engineered kind of vehicles. Now, to go with that, we have this counterfeit rapture talk. And there are these messages that are coming from these supposedly advanced civilizations. Sometimes they say that they're from the Pleiades system. Or, you know, there's some kind of ascended masters. And people are channeling these messages. I believe that they truly are channeling the messages. So I believe the messages that we have here are truthfully communicated to us, but they're absolute lies in their content. All right, so they're accurately presented, but they are false in what they have to say. Cataclysmic events will come upon the world. That's one of the major themes. Uh, these, these ascended masters, these aliens, will help us overcome those events. They will take those that can't or won't evolve uh, to the next level. They'll take them off the planet. And then those that remain get to evolve to the next level now. And they talk about a man from among us will be raised up with special powers and knowledge. We see from Barbara Marcinac, the people who leave the planet during the time of Earth changes do not fit in here any longer and they are stopping the harmony of Earth. 
When the time comes that perhaps 20 million people leave the planet at one time, there will be a tremendous shift in consciousness for those who are remaining. If human beings do not change, if they do not make the shift in values and realize that without Earth they could not be here, then Earth in its love for its own initiation and its reaching for a higher frequency will bring about a cleansing that will balance it once again. There is a potential for many people to leave the planet in an afternoon. As the probable worlds begin to form, there will be great shiftings within humanity on this planet. It will seem that great chaos and turmoil are forming, that nations are rising against each other in war, and that earthquakes are happening more frequently. Earth is shaking itself free, and a certain realignment or adjustment period is to be expected. So you see, what the Bible talks about, the wars and rumors of wars, and the earthquakes in diverse places, Jesus warned us all these things are going to happen. These are all part of the birth pangs. But you see, here we have these ascended masters, these demons, are really preempting that. They are, they're setting a, a track record so that when these things begin to happen, they say, look, we told you these things 20 years ago, 30 years ago, we told you all these things were going to happen. And so people say, oh, the Bible, that's not true. The ascended masters knew about that, and they told Jesus what to say anyway. You see, so they're just, this is now being a, a, a seen as a confirmation that these ascended masters are coming to save the day. In her book, she goes on to say, it will also seem that the animals and fish are departing earth. Those animals are now moving over to the new world as it is being formed. They are not ending their existence. They're merely slipping out into the new world to await your joining them. Hmm, so they're not actually dying. They are dying. But what do we see actually happening? We see massive fish kills around the world. Hundreds of thousands of fish washing up on beaches all over the world, millions in many cases. We see uh, dolphins and whales in the order of, of hundreds washing up randomly on the shores. We see birds 5,000 at a time just dropping out of the sky. Something is going on. And again, the uh, so-called ascended masters would have us believe that this is all part of the earth changes and they're going to come and help us save the day. We have these warnings from Ashtar. Ashtar is simply the same demon who used to go by Ashtoreth back in the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, but now, you know, it's kind of the new and improved look here. And he talks about the great evacuation. Our rescue ships will be able to come in close enough in the twinkling of an eye. Hmm, didn't somebody else use that, that language, I believe? Uh, to set the lifting beams in operation in a moment. And all over the globe where events warrant it, this will be the method of evacuation. Mankind will be lifted, levitated, shall we say, by the beams from our smaller ships. These smaller craft will in turn taxi the persons to the larger ships overhead, high in the atmosphere where there's ample space and quarters and supplies for millions of people. He goes on, there's method and great organization, a detailed plan already near completion for the purpose of removing souls from this planet in the event of catastrophic events making a rescue necessary. The great evacuation will come upon the world very suddenly. The flash of emergency events will be as lightning that flashes in the sky so suddenly and so quick, and it's happening that it is almost over before you're aware of its presence. All of this is setting people up for the disappearance of millions of people. Phase one of the great exodus of souls from the planet will take place at a moment's notice when it is determined that the inhabitants are in danger. Phase two, the second phase immediately following the first, the second phase is vital as we return for the children of all ages and races. So they're saying there's gonna be a disappearance of people. Those will be all the bad people of planet Earth will be leaving. And then these ascended masters will come back and they will help people get comfy in the new world order. He says, look, you left behind, don't worry. It's going to be okay. Do not be concerned if, or not unduly upset or if you do not participate in the first temporary lift up of souls who serve with us. This merely means that your action in the plan is elsewhere and you will be taken for your instructions or receive them in some other manner. Do not take any personal front if you are not alerted or you are not a participant in this first phase of our plan. Your time will come later and these instructions are not necessary for you at this time. According to new author, uh, New Age author K. Wheeler and Chandler, who goes by the name of Osmana, describes how Mother Earth is fighting for her life and in, is in critical condition, which she says is why you see the many crises in the world. She states that Mother Earth must fight for her survival, and we as light bearers can help her. Mother's cleansing, and is all that she knows to do at this time to cleanse herself of the pollution that exists within her body. But you as light bearers can help your mother cleanse in such a way that does not destroy all life on this planet. So here we see that, uh, you know, it's because we're destroying the earth that eventually Mother Earth is going to have to kick us off, at least some of us, and uh, the, the 
the ascended masters will come back and save the day. Now this leads us on to man becoming his own god or transhumanism. You see, all these pieces fit together in the genetics of the mark of the beast. And I'm going to show you how. Transhumanist Richard Seed says we are going to become gods, period. But if you are going to interfere with me becoming a god, you're going to have trouble. There will be warfare. This is what they believe. He doesn't believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or the Creator God, but he believes that he and many others can become gods. And again, these are not just uh, you know, crackpots on the other side of the planet in some back room smoking something. These are people with, with big aspirations, big money, big technology, and they have the means to actually make things happen. Now, we start with transgenics. We'll start with the easy stuff and get over to the harder stuff. Uh, genetic scientists have incorporated selected DNA, spider DNA into goat embryos to engineer a hybrid spider goat. The result is a goat that looks like a goat but acts like a goat, but produces milk which contains proteins which, when treated, produce a very close imitation of the valuable spider silk. You see, silk is the strongest substance known to man ounce for ounce. A single goat only produces small amounts of the desired material, so an extremely large herd is required to acquire useful quantities. So they have literally made a goat that's a goat, but it actually is part spider. Now, it's a very small part spider, obviously, but in its milk, it's able to produce silk. So it's not quite a goat anymore. It's not purely a goat. And it gets worse. We have green eggs and ham. Uh, Taiwan researchers have mingled the seed, the genetic material of pigs with jellyfish that glow in the dark to create real-life green eggs and ham. They claim that while other researchers have bred partly fluorescent pigs, theirs are the only pigs in the world that which are green through and through. The pigs are transgenic, created by adding genetic material from jellyfish into a normal pig embryo. And this, they continue to make all kinds of glow-in-the-dark stuff. They've got glow-in-the-dark cats. They have glow-in-the-dark monkeys. I mean, you name it, they can put this in because they've discovered how to, to uh, find the, the genetic... Uh, code for the, the glow in the dark and they can just insert it at will. It seems kind of fun at this stage of the game, but I believe it's going to get a whole lot worse. According to Juan Enriquez, chairman and CEO of Biotech Comedy, he says humanity is on the verge of becoming a new and utterly unique species, Homo evolutus. What makes this species so unique is that it takes direct and deliberate control over the evolution of the species. All of our organs and limbs have weaknesses that can be addressed, and there are also opportunities to go beyond basic fixes and perform more elaborate enhancements. Again, people like, like Juan, I think his, his desire may be decent, but it comes from a worldview that there is no God, that we evolved this far, and if we, if we have evolved this far, why not just take control of our evolution and become what we want to be? Why not fix those things where we're, we're failing or we're, we're dying, for, for example, and our, our, our organs are not per performing properly? But let's even go beyond that. Instead of just having perfect vision, why not have better than perfect vision? Why not have eagle eye vision? And why not have greater than just regular human strength? Have the strength of a gorilla, for example. And they're looking for those genes in these animals, and they want to splice them in so that we can become greater than, than what we are right now. Well, according uh, to John P. McTurman, who's a Christian, uh, he talks about the genetic Armageddon. He says, the human DNA is what physically carries this image of God in likeness. The addition of animal DNA means that man is no longer in God's image. And it's extremely dangerous to tamper with the integrity of man as transmitted through his DNA. That is, in part, what triggered the flood of Noah's day. All of the hybrid humans were destroyed during the flood, and then God started over with Noah. And that's why I believe that as we unlock Pandora's box of this genetics, while it's starting, and it, it seems rather innocuous at this point, and people are doing it for supposedly noble aspirations. And I don't think that all geneticists are, are bad people, not by any means. I think most of them are working on very noble aspirations. They really do want to help humanity. So I think that's probably 99.9% .9 of all geneticists and scientists out there have good goals. But it's going to be used for a very bad end. And I think we need to be very careful. According to senior counselor for 
Alliance Defense Fund, Joseph and Franco. He says the chimera in Greek mythology was a monster with a lion's head, a goat's body, and a dragon's tail. It was universally viewed by the Greeks as a hideous creature precisely because of its unnatural hybrid makeup. We're in a time where scientists are seriously contemplating the creation of human-animal hybrids, or chimeras. According to Werner Verge in H Plus Magazine, he says, within 30 years, we will have the technological means to create superhuman intelligence. Shortly thereafter, the human era will be ended. And according to Leon Cass, he says, human nature lies, uh, itself lies on the operating table ready for alteration for eugenic and psychic enhancement for wholesale redesign. And leading laboratories and academic industrial new creators are confidently amassing their powers and quietly honing their skills while on the street their evangelists are zealously prophesying a post-human future. For anyone who cares about preserving our humanity, the time has come for paying attention. These are not Christians who are speaking. These are the transhumanists. This is where we are. Humanity itself, our very nature, is being transformed from the inside out. And that is really the goal. And it goes beyond just what humans are able to do. It's going to get a lot worse. We see uh, just in 2011, 150 human-animal hybrids grow in the UK labs. Embryos have been produced secretly for the past three years. But that was 2011. This is happening so quickly that they're making huge advances. Now, and I believe that there are various steps to reject the image of God that God created in mankind. First of all, because man has no fear of God, which is only natural if people feel that God has been disproven through evolution, and of course, if there is no God, then there is no need to submit to his word. Having rejected the author of the word, man is under no obligation, supposedly, to accept the statements in his book. Nor is he seeking the solution to man's problems prescribed in the book. And believing that he has evolved this far, and the complexity of the human body is due to evolution, man believes that he should carry on his own evolution. Man desires to direct, to direct his own destiny and rewrite his source code by mixing it with creatures. By rewriting his DNA, according to his own wisdom, man rejects the image of God, which is coded in his DNA. And should the right opportunity arise, man might be willing to go through the ultimate upgrade and thereby completely reject the image of God. And that's where I believe the mark of the beast comes in. We're looking at a hybrid race. Now, if it's not based on scripture, what do we have? But it is based on scripture. And we see in Daniel 2.44, it's talking about the ten toes. And later in verse 44, he's going to say, in the days of these kings. We have to understand who are these kings, and it's the they that are being talked about. So let's look at the text. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, the angel says to Daniel, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. So we see that it's going to be in the last days that God's going to set up this kingdom. That will be the millennium, of course. And it's in the days of these kings. So they are these kings, and they're going to mingle themselves in the Aramaic, this portion of the scripture is in Aramaic, it's mitarvin lehevon. Mitarvin is what we call a reflexive verb. It means that the subject is doing the action and receiving the action. So it's, they're literally going to mingle themselves with the seed of man. Well, look, uh, procreation happens every day. It's a beautiful thing, it's a miraculous thing, but it's pretty common, we have to admit. So why would the angel say, well, people are going to have babies in the future? Hmm, that doesn't make too much sense. Maybe there must be something more to this. And the translation that I would suggest here to help us understand what is going on is that they will hybridize, mingle, mix, or crossbreed themselves with the genetic material seed of mankind. That's my translation there. That these kings will mingle with the seed of men must necessarily mean that they are different from men. Because if it's just, you know, men and women having babies, there's nothing really special about that. I mean, it's amazing, it's wonderful. If you have a baby, it's, it's a miracle. But it's very, very common. So that's not exactly much of a sign, is it? 
that is, they are not of the seed of men. They are altogether different. They are not human. They are not human. And really our clue comes when we start to look at the fact that the ten toes are the ten kings, which are the ten horns. They're one and the same. The ten toes, the ten horns, and the ten kings are the same. And that's why the angel says to John in the book of Revelation, the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. So these are kings that are alive in John's day, but they're not really in power yet. They're going to be in power at a later time. So if they were alive in John's day, and they're going to be around in the days of Antichrist, that means that they're at least 2,000 years old, and Methuselah kicked the bucket at 969 years, so no human has ever gotten to be that old, so they can't be human. They're not human these are demonic kings. Just like we see in Daniel chapter 10 where it talks about the prince of Persia and the kings of Persia, making reference to the principalities and the powers. It's not talking about human kings, it's talking about demonic kings. And lo and behold, we find that in David Lewis's book, UFO and the End Time Delusion, aliens are preparing to intervene again in world history to lead mankind to a higher level of consciousness. They will select a human person and endow him with superhuman powers and knowledge. This man will lead us to world government and world peace. So these supposed aliens are going to come back. They're going to choose somebody and then give him superpowers. How could they possibly do that? Well, there's been an abduction phenomenon that's going on. Now, again, I want to stress, I don't believe in aliens. I believe that there are demons that are up to no good. Sounds like demons, doesn't it? They're up to no good. And before they came down as the gods coming down to humanity, they came down uh, as these, these uh, godlike creatures, these divine beings that were having relations with women back in the days of Noah. But now they're a little more high tech. You know, being God is so passe. So now they have to come as an alien. And according to Dr. John Mack from the Harvard University, professor of psychiatry, he says, abductees feel themselves being removed from wherever they were. Let me just say this. He didn't get into the, the study of abductions uh, because he wanted to. But people kept coming to him with these very strange stories. And so he interviewed over uh, about 900 people. And he kept finding the same, uh, the same thing. They would go under a hypnotic regression. And it was the same story. The people did not know one another but he had the same elements of the story. And so now he, he explains uh, what he's learned. Abductees feel themselves being removed from wherever they were, floated through a wall or out a car, carried up on this beam of light into a craft, and were subjected to a number of now familiar procedures, which involved the beings staring at them, somehow interfacing with their brain, involves probing of their body, their body orifices, and a complex process whereby they sense that in the case of men, sperm is removed and the women, egg is egg removed. Some sort of hybrid offspring were created which they're brought back to see in later abductions. Weird, isn't it? This is pretty strange stuff. But again, this guy really doesn't have any horse in the race. He's not Christian, so he's not trying to prove the Nephilim. Uh, he's not out looking for aliens. He's just a, a psychiatrist teaching at Harvard, and he kept receiving these people that would come to him with these very, very strange stories. What do you do at that point? You listen to their stories, you, you distill them, and this is what he's discovered. And to, they, their goal is to produce some kind of a new species to, to bring us together, to produce a hybrid species, which the abductees are sometimes told will populate the earth or will be there to carry evolution forward. It's an awkward coming together of a less embodied species, sounds like demons, right? They're not really embodied. That we are, than we are, and us for this evolutionary purpose. It may be that these hybrids, we're told, is what will have to be. Hybrids, Nephilim. It's a kind of insurance policy if the earth continues to be subjected to the exploitation of its living environment. You see, you're wasting the earth, so you have to become a Nephilim hybrid. Strange. He's not the only guy, Dr. David Jacobs out of Temple University. He says, I've been involved with UFO research for about 32 years now, since 1965, and I've never been downcast or depressed about the phenomenon. I've never been pessimistic about it, but I must say that now that I've learned as much as I have learned, I am very, very unsettled and upset by what I see. I do not like what I see. I wish I didn't see this. I wish I hadn't uncovered this. I despair of it. 
And the program ultimately is not abducting people. Abductions are a means to an end. So what we have here is an abduction program, a breeding program, which accounts for all the reproductive activity that we see and a hybridization program. I think all this is leading to an integration program in which ultimately these hybrids, who look very human, will be integrated into this society. And who will eventually, I assume, to be in control here because they do have superior technology and superior psychological abilities, uh, physiological abilities than we, that we do not have. We would therefore be sort of a second class, we'd be second class citizens. So these are going to come, we're going to make some kind of a hybrid race. And if you don't become part of the hybrid race, you'll be a second class citizen. Maybe you'll even be considered a danger to humanity. Maybe you should be exterminated because you're no longer useful on this planet. Now we come to the genetics of Satan's seed. Daniel chapter 7, Daniel says, I was considering the horns and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. So you have this little horn down here, and you go up to these other horns. Now we've already established that the, the horns, the, the kings and the toes are all one and the same. And they were alive in John's day, and they're going to be alive in the days of Antichrist. Therefore, they're demons. They're demonic kings. So you have this little horn is rising up to the level of these other horns. In other words, someone who is human is rising up to the level of demon. How can that happen? He rises up, and he actually becomes greater than them. And it says that, again, the, the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who receive no kingdom as yet. So these are demonic uh, kings. And the Antichrist really becomes a Nephilim. We see also in Daniel chapter 8. And it grew up to the host of heaven. The host of heaven is a reference to angels, good or bad. And it cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground. Clearly we're not talking about Alpha Centauri hitting planet Earth. We're not talking about Betelgeuse hitting planet Earth. We're not talking about the sun hitting planet Earth. That would be a very different kind of experience. We're talking about stars which are angels. It says that Jesus had the seven stars in his right hand which are the seven angels to the seven churches. And Satan takes a third of the stars with his tail which are the angels, the fallen angels in this case. So this, this, this uh, horn or this um, uh, this little this little horn or this beast, he grows up to the host of heaven. He becomes like them of a similar nature. How in the world could he do that? And then he's going to cast three of them to the ground. He now has authority and power over them. So you see, he's really, he's transformed from simply being human. I believe he's born human, but he's actually going to have an upgrade. And he be, he's a genetic hybrid between Satan and human. He literally will become the beast. He will go from just being human to becoming this satanic human hybrid. And then we hear people saying, uh, worshiping the dragon and, the, uh, and who gave authority to the beast and worship the beast, saying, who is like the beast? Nobody. Nobody's like the beast because he is a human demonic hybrid. He's a, a hybrid with Satan himself. Who's able to make war with him? In Daniel 8, he even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host. I think that's referring to Michael. You could say it's maybe Jesus. And by him, the daily sacrifices were taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. He's not just a big talker. He actually has the power to back it up. He's got the credentials. And this is why in 2 Thessalonians, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. It's not just a show, you guys. He's, he's the real deal. Now, he's a counterfeit. He's not, you know, as good as Jesus, obviously. But he does have power. The dragon gave him, that is the beast, his power, his throne, and great authority. This guy has to have something pretty amazing for Satan to give him his power, his throne, and his great authority. Because last I knew, Satan wasn't into sharing too much. He's kind of selfish that way. So this must be a very special person for Satan to want to share. And so they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast who was like him. The genetics of the mark of the beast. Now this is where it gets kind of scary. Because you see, this is not all just a pipe dream. This isn't some fanciful interpretation of scripture. They're actually able 
to uh, using what's called recombinant DNA. This is happening in high school advanced placement classes around the country where they're able to take a, uh, a, 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 li a ligase, which they is now looking for the right code here on this, uh, this strand, and they snip it, and then they can put a different piece of information in. It's kind of like when you go on to your email and you copy and paste. That's what we're talking about here. This is copying and pasting. And then they stitch it back together with these sticky ends. And now you have a new, uh, a new strand of DNA. And then it reproduces. And then you have a whole bunch of these things. This very well could be the mechanism by which the Antichrist will become such. That he'll take Satan's seed and then he'll put it into himself. Uh, it was Nita Horn who first suggested that recombinant DNA may be the means by which the mark of the beast is introduced onto an unsuspecting world through the rewriting of one's DNA. So I have to thank her for the, the spark of the idea. Uh, we also have scientists that have carefully, successfully embed silicon chips inside human cells. Now biological cells can also contain tiny silicon chips. Experiments found that living human cells can ingest or receive injections of silicon chips and continue functioning as usual for the most part. And I do have a video that's coming next. If we could make sure to have a little bit of audio, that'd be great. Uh, Craig Venter and his team have built the genome of a bacterium from scratch and incorporated it into a cell with what they call the world's first synthetic life form. So first they code it on the computer, and then they use what's called a DNA printer to actually print that. Sounds pretty sci-fi, doesn't it? But watch this video and you'll see what After we're talking 10, about. After 10,000 years of genetic manipulation by selective breeding, humans finally gained direct access to the genetic code. Deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA. Since then, we've cut and pasted it, photocopied fragments of it en masse, sped read it with sequences, printed out the code, letter by letter in the lab, modelled it on computers, and measured it with microscopes. For 40 years now, we've called this work genetic engineering. The trouble is that while there's been an extraordinary amount of genetic discovery and manipulation, there's been precious little engineering. Engineers are frustrated by genetics and molecular biology. The experiments are too slow, the complexity too messy, and growing more so all the time, and there's a frustrating lack of standardized components. They'd like to do to genetic engineering what engineers have done since the Stone Age. Collect, refine, and repackage nature so that it's easier to make new and reliable things. Engineers want to treat DNA more like a programming language. Instead of ones and zeros, A's, T's, G's, and C's. They want to use DNA to write simple, Lego-like functional components, inspired by, but not found in nature, and then run them in a cell instead of a computer. The only difference is this software builds its own hardware. They call this re-engineered genetic engineering synthetic biology. Nowadays, rather than cut and paste the DNA sequence out of one organism and into another, you can, if you know what you're doing, just type your DNA sequence into a computer, or copy it from a database, or even select from a growing component catalog. And then you just order it over the internet. Yes, really. The DNA sequence may be copied from nature, but the DNA itself is made by a machine. It's synthetic. The raw material for synthesizing DNA is sugar. $25 of which will buy you enough to make a copy of every human genome on the planet. The chemical letters are fed into the DNA equivalent of an industrial inkjet printer. In goes your sequence information and out comes DNA at a cost of less than 40 cents per base pair and getting cheaper all the time. It's then freeze dried and shipped to your door. <laughs> Crazy, huh? All right, so putting these pieces together, what does this look like? Essentially, Satan is going to give his code. When we talk about the seed of Satan, I don't think that he has to sort of use the old-fashioned method of procreation anymore. Uh, I don't think he's even that excited about that. I don't think he, Satan likes humans at all. 
but he does have a he does have a, a plan to take over the world, and if he can then give his genetic code, his seed, his DNA, his information, that's the key. Understand that it's information that we're talking about. If he can somehow replicate his information and give it to the man of his choosing, is to basically take that code, they could, through the process of synthetic biology, they could put that into a computer, and then they could print out the DNA sequence. And then using recombinant DNA, you could inject that into the person, and it would then go in and become part of you, and then it would spread throughout your system with the right technology, and you would literally be transformed. I believe that is what's going to happen to the Antichrist, that he is going to do what Jesus did not do. He's going to actually bow down to Satan, say, you're the greatest. And then Satan says, great, here's my kingdom. Here's my throne. Here's my power. It's all yours. I give it to you. And here's my DNA as well. Take this, and you can become like me. You will rise up above these other demons. You will become their king. You'll become their master because now you are mingled with me. You see, this is the ultimate counterfeit to the incarnation. You see, God, through the Holy Spirit, overshadowed Mary and the necessary chromosomes for Jesus from the Holy Spirit, coupled with the chromosomes from Mary, produced the body for the Lord Jesus Christ. And he becomes the savior of humanity. Well, here's your ultimate counterfeit. Satan is now taking his information and he's giving it to the person of his choosing who by using high-tech means can become this hybrid creature. And then what he will do, this antichrist fellow, he will then come in the guise of hanging out with the ascended masters or the aliens and say, look, uh, I used to be just like you guys, but now they have raised me up. They've given me their DNA. This really sounds crazy, but it's very much mainline because there are many mainline scientists. Uh, you have uh, Michio Kaku, who is a, um, a, a physicist. He's known throughout the world. He appears on CNN and Fox a lot of times. You also have Francis Crick, who is a co-discoverer of DNA. You have Stephen Hawking and many others who believe in directed panspermia. Directed panspermia is the idea that it was the aliens or some kind of alien life force that dropped off DNA on planet Earth. If you happen to see the movie um, Pr Prometheus, then you saw that it was literally the aliens that dropped off their DNA. Uh, others, you know, in looking at the, the question for life, I was watching a video recently, and their question of where did life come from? They're looking at the rocks on planet Earth. They're like, it's pretty unlikely that, that life could originate here on these sterile rocks. But they say, maybe the, maybe the answer isn't that far away, and they look up into the heavens. Maybe it came from outer space. And they're like, well, how did life get started in outer space? But they don't care. As long as it didn't start here and it wasn't started by God, it was the aliens who started life on planet Earth. And they're going to come back and save the day. That's the message. So now they're going to raise up a man from, from our midst. They're going to endow him with superhuman powers. They're going to get basically Satan's DNA. Now you might say, wait a second, wait a second. How do you know that angels even have seed? Well, did you know that God has seed? It says in 1 John 3, 9, no one having been born again continues to sin for the seed of God dwells in him. The, the word there in Greek is sperma, sperm. The sperm of God dwells in him. You're like, well, wow, that's weird. It is weird. But it's not talking about the hardware. It's talking about the software. So when we start thinking about Satan's seed, don't think about the hardware because that kind of trips you up. Think about the software. And when he passes on that code to the person of his choosing, who then puts it into hardware, and he's then transformed from the inside out, then this person will then take this, you know, his new self, and he will then give that to all of humanity as a solution for death, for sickness, etc. And anybody who's not willing to take that will be seen as a detriment to society, as a danger. What, you're not going to take the mark and be upgraded? Well, you're endangering all of us. And so I think that these will essentially be mercy killings. 
I, I don't think anybody's going to be uh, forced to take the mark of the beast. I think Satan, as a legalist, has to have people sign on and actually want to take it. But people will want to take it. Because who doesn't want to be an X-Men? Who doesn't want to be Spider-Man or the Incredible Hulk? And if you have the potential of living forever, if you just take this tiny little thing, why wouldn't you do that? It will, uh, in my opinion, uh, the, the mark on the forehead or on the hand will simply be a proof of purchase. Uh, I don't think it's simply a chip. I think a chip you can put in, you can chip you can take out. But whoever takes the mark of the beast will be tormented forever without any mercy. There's no going back once you take the mark of the beast. And I think it's not just simply the implantation of a computer chip, but it's the absolute transformation of the person at the genetic level. And that's why there is no going back, because God says that he gives mercy to the sons of Ad Abraham, but he doesn't to the demons or to the angels, because once they have made their decision, it's over. They are changed forever, and there's no going back on that decision. And that's why taking the mark of the beast is so severe. That's why there's an angel flying through heaven. Whoever takes the mark of the beast, let him, be, let him know this. And they're, they're warning humanity, don't do it. Don't do it. But Satan is going to use an incredible deception. He's not just going to show up, show up and say, hey, take the mark of the beast. You spend forever in hell. It's really a great time. No, he comes with a carrot instead of a stick. Right? And the carrot is you can become this immortal being. You can have superhuman intelligence, superhuman strength, and everything your heart desires and live forever just by taking this. And I believe in Revelation chapter 9 when it says that men will seek death, but it will escape them. That they have taken the mark of the beast. And the reason they can't die is because they've become immortal to some extent. Uh, not that they can never ever die, they will eventually. But they can't die in the good old fashioned ways. Uh, because they've taken the mark of the beast at that point. So... The New Agers are waiting for a DNA upgrade for the cosmic Christ to lead them to the next level. We see that millions are going to disappear from the globe, the, the rapture. The leader of the, the Galactic Federation comes to the Antichrist. And again, we're your space brothers. Take our DNA because we're here to help. We will give you all these incredible powers. And so there's really two paths before the world. You can take what Jesus has freely offered it is the ultimate upgrade. You will get an amazing body in the future, one that will never uh, decompose, that will never degenerate. Uh, you will have superhuman strength, you'll have superhuman intelligence, and you'll be able to be in the presence of God Almighty and that, all that fiery kind of stuff. You'll have the ultimate body. I highly recommend you go for option A. <laughs> option B is Satan offering the same thing here. No, no, take, take, take my seat upon you and you can live forever and have all these other things. But it's going to end very, very poorly because it is a counterfeit of the real thing. So we see this in movies. We see all over what Satan is trying to do. He's, he's deceiving the, everyone on the planet. We've got to be careful. And I think that it's our job to warn people of what is coming. So that when they go and they watch these movies, they see in the, the pop culture things like Katy Perry ET videos and such. We need to let them know, hey, there's something very, very sinister here. It's not just, you know, people doing their stuff. It's no big deal. There's a sinister plot that Satan has planned. And I believe that if Satan is able, which he won't be, but in his mind, if he's able to corrupt the human seed and ultimately the Jewish people as well, then he can avert his own destruction and he can have a tie with God. I'm going to let Jesus have the final words. He says, constantly be on your guard so that your hearts may not be loaded down with self-indulgence, drunkenness, or the worries of this life, or that day will take you by surprise, like a trap. For it will come upon all who live on the face of the earth, so be alert at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to take your stand in the presence of the Son of Man. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for the warning that you give us in here. We pray that we would apply it to our lives. And we pray that we would be uh, watchmen on the wall and let people know of what is coming. And all, even though we see all these incredible technological advances and they're rather exciting in many respects, Lord, but 
their ultimate goal, I believe, is a very bad end. And so we pray that we could uh, let people know of what is coming. Thank you, Lord, that you have given us the ultimate upgrade, that when we believe in your name, we will have a new body, we'll be in your presence, and it's free for the taking, free for the asking. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you.